Stanford University. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the midterm review session for CS224N. Um, I'm just going to start with some announcements. So the first one, as you are hopefully aware, uh, homework two is due today. And um, we had an issue with the submission script that made submissions uh, unavailable for a couple hours. Um, so we apologize for that, but that is now fixed. Um, there's a slight change to the submission instructions to the initial version, and that is that um, we don't want you to include the trained weights for your models, um, because it turns out that takes up a lot of space, and then we run out of AFS, and we can't take any more submissions. Um, so we apologize for that inconvenience. Um, the other thing due today is the project proposal. So these are both due at midnight. And um, we are saying that if you have not yet found a mentor, but you would still like to do a final project other than the default final project, um, you can still submit a project proposal and say that you have not found a mentor yet, and we will do our best to find you a mentor anyway. Um, now for a couple notes on the midterm. So the midterm is Tuesday, um, same time as a regular lecture. Um, but I want to point out that it's not being held here. It's being held in Memorial Auditorium. Um, there is an alternate exam, um, only if you cannot at all make the uh, February 14th uh, normal midterm time. And if you want to take the alternative exam, or you have to take the alternative exam, um, post about that on Piazza. Um, we are allowing a single cheat seat. Uh, and um, the material on this midterm is all the lectures, um, including um, the most recent one, um, the midterm is going to be a mix of multiple choice and true false questions, short answer questions, um, and some longer, more involved questions that may involve gradient computation. Um, and then for SCPTs, uh, SCPD students, um, you have to turn up in person or um, have an exam monitor uh, pre-registered. So the rest of this lecture is going to be just review material to help prepare you for the midterm. And in particular, um, we're going to cover word vector representations, um, neural network basics, um, backpropagation and gradient computation, and we'll do some uh, example problems on the whiteboard for that section, um, RNNs, and dependency parsing. Um, and with that, I will leave it to our uh, first section, word vector representations. All right, we can start that again. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> so what are word vectors? For, for every word, we could come up with a vector that encapsulates semantic information about the word. There could be various ways of interpreting what meaning or semantic representation could be, and which is why it, so it severely depends on how you actually go about training your word vectors. In this class, we first covered word 2 and glove, and we'll be reviewing that now. So just to recap, word 2, word two vec the task for it is learn word vectors to encode the probability of a given word it, it, of, of a word given its context. Now consider this example. Our window size is two here. I understand the word to vec model now. If you consider the center word to be word to vec, understand the and model now become context words. And we'll see how to probabilistically model this now. So uh, for each word, we have two vectors: the input vector and the output vector. The input vector is represented by v, and the output vector by u. And we'll see how v and u are used in the model now. So we'll be covering two algorithms here, skipgram, which predicts the probability of the context words given the center word, and the continuous bag of words, or CBAO, which predicts the center word from surrounding context. All right. So to recap on skipgram, uh, consider the sentence again, where I understand the word to vec model now. And in this case, since the center word is uh, word to vec, that'll be the only word that's left, and the context words would be omitted. And our job is to actually go about and uh, assign probabilities to the words there. So how do we go about doing this? We first generate a one-hot vector. In this case, the, the, this vector would have the same dimensions as the number of words in your vocabulary, with one at the index of the word word to vec, and zero everywhere else. 
Now we need to use this one hot vector to index into our embedding mat matrix, which is capital V, the input vector embedding matrix. And uh, we'll obtain uh, a word vector corresponding to that, uh, to that word. We then go and do a dot product with, our, uh, um, with the output word vectors U and to generate a score for it. So far so good, any questions? All right. So once we get a score, we, assign, we get the probabilities by using softmax. And once we have those, we, can, we have softmax probabilities for every context word, and we can then find out which word actually would go into these context windows. How do we actually go about training this? We, tr we assign our cost, which is either given by softmax cross-entropy cross or the negatives and neg neg negative sampling loss. And it's, as you can see, the formula takes uh, abstracts over the uh, cost function over there. So we take, uh, uh, we take the input vector and we take the word vector uh, for the context words and we apply these cost functions and then sum them over. Right? And our job is to minimize this loss. I'm using cost and loss interchangeably as we will do that in the midterm and in the class as well. Right? Sweet. So that was skip gram. Now we move on to continuous uh, bag of words, CBAO. Uh, now let's take the previous sentence again. I understand the word to vec model now. In this case, our job is to actually predict the context word, or, or the center word, my bad, uh, given the context words. So in this case, our job would be to actually guess the word to vec model here. So in this case, uh, as in the previous case as well, we generate one hot vectors for each of the context words uh, by, and this would again be the size of the, uh, the size of your vocabulary with one at the index of uh, the word itself. And then we, uh, we look into our embedding matrix, uh, again, the in input vector embedding matrix, and obtain the word vectors for those context words. We take the average of those uh, word vectors and then uh, compute the score again by multiplying with the output vector matrix. Now that we have the scores, we can get the probabilities by computing the softmax function. And now we have, uh, pro uh, for each of the words in your vocabulary, we have a probability assigned with what, uh, how likely it is to be the center word. All clear so far? This, is, uh, this should be pretty clear since we also had a live coding session on this. Sweet. Um, the cost function here is similar to the one in skipgram, except in this case it takes in the average of the word vectors as one of the arguments and the word uh, and the center word itself. And again, our job is to minimize uh, the loss here. Sweet. Um, the other, we didn't do this as a part of the assignment, but uh, Glove is a pretty famous set of word vectors as well. Like word to vec, it also captures semantic information about the words. And, but unlike word 2 vec however, it, it also takes into account the co-occurrence uh, statistics. And we'll see what we refer to just in a second. Uh, from one of the lines in our, uh, in our review notes, GLOVE consists of weighted least square model that trains on global word word co-occurrence counts. So what do we mean by co-occurrence? Consider our corpus to be only a set of three sentences. I like deep learning, I like NLP, and I enjoy flying. Now you can see that we can come up with a n by n where n represents the number of words in our corpus uh, matrix where each index corresponds to uh, whether this word belongs, uh, whether word j belongs in the context window of word i. Okay. This is a symmetric matrix as well. So you can, as you can assume, the ordering does not matter. So let, let us denote this matrix by x. And so if you index into this using i and j, that would be the number of times word j occurs in the context of word i. And let us also denote x i to be the number of times any word appears in the context window of i word i. Just like in word to vec, we also have two vectors for each word here, the input vector and the output vector. And the cost function is given by the equation here. Uh, there are a couple of interesting things about this cost function which we'll cover right in a second. But uh, a few things to note here. Um, the, we are applying the least squares as we, as we mentioned earlier. We are iterating over every pair of words in that co-occurrence co matrix. What's interesting is that since you can imagine words like the or a, the articles as, as well as the stop words would have a large xij value, we need to sort of clip on it. And the other option is to just take the logarithm of it. And so, which is why you can see there's a log uh, over the xij over there. 
So any questions about the cost function here? OK, let's move on then. So now after, train, after minimizing this loss for the glove word vectors, we will be having v and u, where v represents the output word vectors and u represents the input. Um, and uh, we, since both of these capture similar co-occurrence information, we can obtain the word vector for a single word just by summing them up. So just u plus v will equal the word vector for that particular word. And we can use that for all sorts of NLP tasks. It's essentially an embedding for that word. So before we move on from word vector representations, any questions on uh, the, any of the terminology? We got, we got a lot of questions about well, how does an embedding ref, uh, differ from a word vector. So we just want, um, want to make sure that that definition uh, ambiguity is cleared up. Yes, please. Uh, it is a it is a vector. I, I mean, it is it is the it is a scalar. Oh yes. Uh, the the question was why if x i is a vector, uh, how can uh, shouldn't the loss actually be referring to a scalar? Um, x i is actually a scalar because it's solely the number of times that word appears in the context window of any other word. X i so x i is defined as the number of times any word k appears in the context. So it's not a vector. Yes. Right, so the, um, uh, I, uh, most research papers tend to use embeddings and word vectors pretty interchangeably. Basically, you can imagine it's a vector that encapsulates semantic information. Um, so in terms of analogies, you can imagine that if you, had king, uh, if you had word vectors for king, man, queen, and woman, then if you subtract king minus uh, queen, it should be roughly equivalent to man minus woman, for example. Okay, sweet. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so those uh, input vectors and output vectors are solely just uh, differing in the sense that if you have a context word, we want to predict the output vector for it. So in any case, you're considering a word solely, you're considering only the uh, output vectors. Okay? Um, all right, so let's cover neural networks. This will be roughly quick because we also have RNNs and LSTMs to cover. Uh, so coming back to the basics, you have a data set X and Y, where X is the input, Y are the labels, and you want to train a one hidden layer neural network on this. You do a forward pass given by x, w plus b, uh, and then you apply a nonlinearity or a activation function on it. You compute the loss. You compute the gradients from that loss using backpropagation. We'll go into depth in backpropagation with Barack. Uh, and then we update the weights using an optimization algorithm like stochastic gradient descent, or SGD. We do perform hyperparameter tuning on the dev set, not on the test set, and then evaluate the neural network on the test set itself. All right. So this was a very high-level overview of uh, how neural networks are trained. Uh, let's go over the activation functions or the nonlinearities uh, quite quickly. So we have the sigmoid function. What it does, it takes an input and squashes it between 0 and 1. However, this has some problems. If the activation function was very large, if the activation was very large, it will still always end up being 1. Or if the activation is really small, it will still end up always being 0. So you can imagine that a lot of neurons get saturated by this. Um, and the output is not centered as zero. This is particularly bad because if the output of our sigmoid is always a positive number, then the gradients are always negative or positive. And we do not want that. Like, we want the uh, gradients to be more adaptive. Okay. Another issue with this is also that it's, it takes the exponent and it's computationally expensive. But nothing inherently wrong with the uh, math there. Okay. Then the tan h function uh, takes an input, squashes it between negative one and one. Here, in this case, the output is centered at zero, so which is a nice thing, uh, and it sort of resolves the problem that sigmoid had. However, similar to sigmoid, this also kills the gradients at saturation, and which is why uh, tanage is not as good as well. Yes? Right, so uh, if your input, if, if the output of your not, uh, the question was, why is, it, why is it bad that the output of our activation function is centered at zero, or is not centered at zero? So if the output of your activation function is always positive, then, uh, you, uh, then the gradients uh, are always either always positive or always negative, because they can only go in one of the two directions, always. 
Uh, they do break the semantics. So we are able to train networks with these functions. So it's not like it's the end of the world in terms of training neural networks. But it's, it's just something that, so in this case, what would actually be better is that you take your input and you center it as zero. Either way works. Okay. Um, moving on to ReLU, uh, the rectified linear unit, which essentially takes a max and checks if it's greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, it returns the same value. This uh, does not have the problem of saturation because it's linear. Uh, it's computationally cheap. There's, there are no exponent calculations. And it's also empirically known to converge faster. Right? Uh, yes? Yeah, so th th that is an, uh, so which is why I have a, the second point in the problems is referring to that. Yeah, so the problem with this uh, is that it's again not centered at zero. Uh, the larger problem with this, and it's slightly annoying as well, is that if the input is, is less than zero, then the ReLU gradient is always zero. And this is a problem because once a neuron dies, it always is dead. Like you can never revive a neuron after, it, uh, after the input becomes less than zero. Sad times, I know. Um, anyways, moving on to stochastic gradient descent or the optimization algorithm. Uh, in this case, theta represents our weights or the parameters. Alpha is our learning rate and j is our loss or the cost function. And uh, going very technically, uh, SGD update happens after every training example. However, uh, researchers tend to abuse the notation and call minibatch SGD also normal SGD. And what minibatch stochastic gradient descent does is it takes a small batch of training examples at once and averages their loss over before performing the gradient update. Okay. Yeah. Moving on to regularization, uh, this is a form of, uh, dropout is a form of re regularization, and it randomly drops neuron at forward pass during training. Well, this might seem very counterintuitive that it should work. It does because it prevents overfitting. It forces the network to learn dependencies. When you have s fewer number of neurons to learn the same task, it forces each neuron to capture more important information about uh, your in of your data and learn more important uh, abstractions. So think about dropout as uh, training an ensemble of networks. Every time you run, uh, you run your network during forward pass, a couple of neurons are dropped, and as a result, you're, tr you're getting a new network almost every time, and then you're training, it, uh, training an ensemble of networks. During test time, make sure that you turn your dropout off so that you, you again, take this ensemble of networks and then use the shared power between all these networks. Okay. Any questions on dropout? Yes. Uh, so it depends. If you uh, if you make sure that um, so the question was, do you have to scale your output at whenever you run dropout at test time? And the answer to that is no. And just because um, uh, it, if you in, if during test time you make sure that your uh, activations are al already scaled correctly, then you don't have to do it during test time. Okay. So a few training trips and tricks here. Uh, these are a couple of loss plots. So the one in the green represents a, a phenomenon where your loss is very, uh, is very noisy. And what happens, you can see the jagged line. And in this case, what must be happening is that since your gradient updates are very large, you are, over, um, you are not converging properly. You are almost iterating over and around uh, the local minima, and which is why it's advisable to lower your learning rate in that case. If it's blue, you see that there is high potential for your network to actually train faster, and hence you should, high, high, uh, you should make your learning rate higher. Okay. Uh, the red line is sort of an ideal one. Again, this are uh, something that I just drew off on paint, so it's not something that's uh, very technical. It's just intuition. All right. Uh, so if you're, uh, this is something that you must have faced uh, issues with in the last assignment, where if the gap between your training curve and your dev, dev, dev accuracy is very large, that means you're overfitting. And in this case, there are a couple of ways you can actually counter that. One is by increasing your regularization constant. This could be by increasing, uh, by decrease, uh, by increasing your dropout rate or by increasing the L2 norm rate. Okay. And again, this is very important to stress that do not test your model on the test set before you're done resolving overfitting issue. It almost sort of breaks the scientific pipeline if you if you test your network on the test set and then tweak your parameters because you're not supposed to look at the test set. So the question was, if you're not supposed to test on the test set, then what kind of data are you supposed to test it on? And uh, the answer to that is you can divide your data into three parts, training, dev, and test. You train on the train, you evaluate uh, regularly on the dev set, and then finally at the very end test on the test set. Uh, 
with that, I'll leave it to Barack for backpropagation and gradients. All right, hi everyone. It's another bright and sunny day to do some backpropagation. I mean, cold and rainy. Um, I think it's also pretty ironic. The last time I spoke to you from here, I told you about all of the wonderful things that TensorFlow can do with automatic differentiation, and here we are again computing gradients by hand. Um, but anyway, so the main ideas of this part of the review uh, is to go over some of the intuition and the math behind backpropagation, as well as how to use it in practice. Uh, before I begin, I highly urge you to check out Kevin's notes on gradient computations, as well as some of the principles behind like matrix calculus. I think it's very helpful to understand um, what's on those notes uh, to help you the most with the midterm. Okay, so our, our itinerary is to first review what backpropagation is, uh, then to have a quick chat about matrix calculus. Uh, then we're going to talk about how to uh, compute uh, products of gradients correctly. In other words, when do I transpose my darn symbols? Um, and then we're going to solve uh, two midterm problems. Okay, so the problem statement that we're looking at is given some function f with respect, uh, with respect to inputs x, um, and some labels y, including some parameters theta, we want to compute the gradient of your loss with respect to all of your parameters theta. And what backpropagation is, it is, is, it is an algorithm that allows you to compute the gradient for some compound function as a series of local intermediate gradients. So if you have some compound function, backpropagation is the tool that you have that allows you uh, to compute the total gradient uh, through an application of the chain rule to all of the local intermediate gradients in your function. So there are three kind of parts to backpropagation. The first is that you want to identify what your intermediate functions are, i.e. the intermediate variables. And this is basically done for you in the forward propagation stage. You then want to know what the local gradients are of all of the variables inside your compound function. And then you want to somehow combine those through some application of the chain rule to get your full gradient. So the first thing that we need to talk about is what modularity is. And let us look at, it at an extremely simple example. We have some function of three scalar variables, x, y, z. We're going to add x and y and then multiply that by z. Our intermediate variable is q, which is equal to x plus y. And our final compound function is q times z. So the idea of modularity is to kind of separate out our smaller operations such that at each level, of our forward propagation, we know how to compute the gradient of the output with respect to our inputs of interest. So the key idea of modularity is that it allows you to separate out the operations that you're using so that at each point, you're able to calculate the gradient in some sort of palatable way. OK, so modularity for a neural network is basically what we've seen in our assignment so far in terms of splitting up our compound function as a series of all of our um, like propagation steps. So in this example of a two-layer uh, neural network, we have the loss as some cross-entropy of a sigmoid activation of some linear function, again, applying a linear function over that uh, and taking the cross-entropy with y. So our intermediate variables are going to be all the things you're familiar with. It's going to be our hidden layer. It's going to be the activation. It's going to be our scoring, uh, which is z2 in this example, followed by our loss. So the idea is, is that at each step, of this forward propagation stage, we know how to compute the gradient of our output with respect to our inputs. So let us look at, at how the forward propagation and the backward propagation relate to each other. On the left, we have the forward propagation, which is where the values from our input are propagated down through our network, and we're basically computing the value of our compound function. What is happening in backward propagation is basically the reverse side of the mirror, where at each point we take the gradient at that level with respect to the variable above it. So the last thing that we need to do to finish off our back propagation um, is to find out how we're going to merge all of these local gradients together to get our total gradient. And this is as good a time as ever to talk about the chain rule. So the key intuition behind the chain rule is that slopes multiply. So if I'm trying to take the derivative of some sort of compound function f and g of some input x over that x, it's going to equal the derivative of our total function with respect to the intermediate value times the derivative of the intermediate value uh, over our inputs. And this is a bit of a, a mathematical wonder, you might think, that it's, it's so beautiful that if you have two functions, you can just um, multiply the slope of the intermediate by the slope of the function that happens after that. So this is kind of like the key tool that allows backpropagation to work. <laughs> 
Another useful uh, analogy for understanding backpropagation is looking at circuit diagrams. So this is going to be the circuit diagram of our initial uh, simple example. We're going to add x and y, and that is our q node over there. We're going to multiply that by our z variable, and that gives us an f. So the green values in this uh, diagram represent the forward propagation values, and the red values represent the backward propagation. So looking to the rightmost, we start off with an error value of 1, because trivially, the derivative of f with respect to itself is just 1. What is interesting, though, is if we look at the error signal that is happening at the Q node, it's currently minus 4, because the derivative of f with respect to Q is just going to be the value of z minus 4. We know that the derivative of Q with respect to x is just 1. But what we're going to do to get the total gradient at position x is we're going to multiply that gradient times our error signal that is flowing into Q. And this is, I guess, like the key point uh, of what we're showing here. And um, we'll see how this kind of like uh, figure can help us uh, do backpropagation in midterm questions uh, soon. OK, are there any questions so far about this, uh, this large overview of backpropagation before we start talking about matrix calculus? Great. OK, moving so, to some matrix calculus. Um, so let us first talk about derivatives over vectors. Um, so the derivative over a vector is going to be a matrix of partial derivatives, where the derivative of each row is going to be the derivative of that index of the output with respect to all of the indices of your input x. So for the scalar by vector example, you're going to get a single vector where each column is going to be the partial of y by the partial of x at that particular column index. In the vector by vector case, we're going to have a matrix of partial derivatives where each row is the partial of yi on the i row by, um, by all of the indices at position x. The case for, for derivatives over matrices, oh, question. The question was, uh, does the presentation of the derivatives change with respect to whether x and y are column vectors? So a slightly, um, a potentially complicated answer to your question is that each of these derivatives represents the Jacobian of that derivative. That is a matrix that takes as input whatever shape your x is and outputs the shape of y. So if x was a row vector, yes, uh, the presentation would actually be like transposed. Yes, question. Um, so the question was, which convention, are we going to be using the convention that x is a row or column? Uh, that depends on the question, and it will be stated very clearly when you're taking derivatives uh, in that question. OK, so the case for derivatives over matrices is slightly more complicated. Um, and it's complicated for this reason. You can interpret y as a function. If I'm trying to compute my partial of y over my partial of a, where y is a scalar, y is actually going to be a function of every single element inside your matrix A. OK, so the proper derivative of partial y over partial A is actually going to be an element of, oh, thanks, uh, is actually going to be an element of Rmn. So the true, the true Jacobian derivative of partial y over partial a is actually going to be some long form vector of size mn. But this is not such a good presentation for us when we want to do derivatives of matrices. So we actually rearrange that sort of derivative to be some matrix of derivatives where the partial of y at each index is going to correspond to the partial of the index at that position a. The case for derivatives of vectors over matrices is even more complicated because the true form derivative of a, de of a derivative over a matrix is actually some sort of three-dimensional array, or it's going to be like a tensor, a tensor that is sort of beyond the scope uh, of what we're trying to do here. So since we're only interested in computing gradients of our loss scalars with respect to matrices, we can actually hide out that sort of strange three-dimensional array derivative thing, because we're going to be computing it by some error signal from above. And let me show you what that means over here. So if we're interested in computing uh, the derivative of z with respect to a, let us look at what the derivative would be of that z with respect to a single element inside our a matrix. So 
you can think of AIJ as representing the sensitivity of the ith index of the output with respect to the jth index of the input. And this is what we're going to be looking at. So the, va the derivative at the ith position of the dz gradient is going to be exactly the value of xj in our input x, since that is... Um, since that is what is modifying the A. And this leads to the identity that the partial, of J the partial of J over the partial of Aij is going to equal the dot of our delta, of our delta gradient flowing inwards at exactly position I, since that is what's being, since that is the only value that is not zero in our derivative of Z over Aij times the value at xj. And this leads to the identity of dj by dA. So you can totally ignore, you can somewhat ignore this slide and just focus on the identity for the purposes of the midterm. But this might be um, a bit of an explanation of what it means to take sort of derivatives over matrices. OK, so on this slide, I have for your reference a list of perhaps the most useful identities um, that you'll need uh, for computing all of the gradients that we use in our midterms. Um, and I won't explain this now, but the slides are online. So I highly urge you uh, to check these out or to check them in the notes. So are there any questions before, um, we, move, before we move onwards? Awesome. OK, so... One thing that you might notice from the previous slides is that the nice thing of taking derivatives of scalars over vectors or matrices is that the shape of our output has the same dimensions as the shape of our input, both in the scalar by vector case and the scalar by matrix case. So what we enforce when we do backpropagation is this shape rule, where when, when you take the gradients against a scalar, which is what you're essentially always doing, the gradient at each intermediate step has, a sh has the shape of your denominator. So if x, whether it's a row vector, column vector, or matrix, has shape m by n, the error signal of d scalar, i.e. our loss, by dx, um, is equal to uh, the same size as our denominator. And what this allows us to do is dimension balancing. So this is going to be uh, the general gradient for any sort of matrix multiplication you do on any gradient question, where x and w can be either both matrices, or x can be a row vector and w a matrix, or x can be a matrix and w a column vector. So this is a general form. So if z is going to be some m times w matrix, and we represent the error at that point as partial loss over partial z as being delta, that because of our shape rule, we know has shape m times w, how do we find out what the dimension of our x of our d loss by dx? Well, if we are looking for, if we're looking for a gradient of shape m times n, and we know we're going to be multiplying our gradient signal by w using our identities from the previous slide, then we realize that we need to take the transpose of w so that the w is on the left side and the Delta is the, and the W is on the right side of the delta. So you can kind of solve these identities by looking at the dimensions of all of your terms and making sure they balance out to give you the correct, um, the correct dimensions for the gradients by matching the gradient of your error and the gradient, uh, the gradient, uh, the dimensions of your gradient and the dimensions of your term. Are there any questions about this dimension balancing concept? The question was, what is delta? Delta is going to be the error signal at the point of z. So since we're trying to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to x and the level above that, like the intermediate variable above that is z, to, use the, to apply the chain rule, we're going to have delta represent the derivative up to the point z, and we're going to multiply that as, as an application of our chain rule with the derivative of, e, of, with the derivative of z with respect to x. So the idea whenever we're, um, if I'm starting with some z as a matrix multiplication of x and w, and I want to know what my derivative of loss with respect to w is, using the chain rule, I know that that's the derivative of the loss with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to w. So this is going to be our intermediate variable that we're taking our local gradient of. And we know what the derivative of this with respect to this is. But this is going to give us the error signal up to that point. 
the error signal records what the value of the error is up to the point of this intermediate computation. Okay? The error signal is kind of what the gradient is up to the point of your equation of the loss down, uh, down to the last variable that you're looking at, which is the output of that expression. Okay. All right. So it kind of feels like dimension balancing is this kind of like cheap and dirty approach to doing gradient calculations, but they are indeed kind of like the most, um, the most efficient tool that you have to computing uh, gradients quickly um, in most practical settings and especially the midterm. But I do encourage you to read the gradient computation notes uh, if you want to understand uh, how, how the gradients work in uh, from first principle. The last thing that I want to talk about is how gradients over activation functions uh, work. So one of the questions that we fielded frequently in office hours is, why is it the case that when you're taking gradients over an activation function, you're doing this element-wise multiplication or Hadamard product? And the answer to that is, if you're looking at, so the answer to that is that the activation function is a scalar, is a, is a function that maps a scalar to another scalar. Um, though we represent z as a fun, as z as a vector, uh, as a sigmoid of an entire vector h, the sigmoid is actually being applied to each, indiv uh, each individual element in that vector, which maps the same index in your output. So the, the way we represent the true gradient, the true derivative, is that it's going to be a diagonal matrix where each index on your leading diagonal is going to be the gradient at position, at, uh, at, uh, uh, the gradient of the ith index of your input. And multiplying some matrix or vector by a diagonal matrix is equivalent to doing the element-wise multiplication of a vector itself, which we represent as the Hadamard product. Okay, uh, are there any questions about what we, we've discussed so far before we get to some midterm problems? Yes. If you uh, go back to this slide where this is the true, uh, sorry, uh, to, this is the true Jacobian form of the partial of some y vector with respect to x, you can see that it's a matrix that takes as input a column vector x and maps it to an output y. Um, so, so if the, the linear transfer, the, the shape of your Jacobian takes as an input something with shape x and maps to an output something with a shape y, which is exactly what is happening in the top, the top left box uh, over here. I th uh, can we talk about that question uh, maybe after the lecture so we can move on because we have a few more sections? Okay, uh, so let's get through, uh, and, and maybe uh, when we actually do some midterm problems, uh, it'll become more apparent uh, how it works. Okay, so the first question that we're going to look at is to do with Siamese networks. And a Siamese network uh, basically allows you to compute a similarity metric uh, between two inputs x, uh, between an x1 and some x2 inputs. And this allows you to sort of compare the similarity of two word vectors or two sentences. So the first thing that I like to do when we're um, taking, when we're starting some gradient problem is to draw a graph of, of how our variables are related to each other. So what we can see is we start off with some j at the top, we have our cost function j. It takes as input an h1 and an h2 as two hidden vectors. These are activations of z1 and z2. And I am defining these variables my myself, so I need to specify what they are. 
And this is going to be, in this problem, we're treating our inputs as column vectors. And on, for z2, it's going to equal to x2 plus b. So we have two inputs, x1 and x2. And one interesting thing to notice about Siamese networks is that the variables, double, sorry, the parameters w and b are shared across both of these activations. So if we're interested in taking the derivative of j with respect to w, we need to add the derivatives coming from both branches down. So the first thing that I like to do when I'm computing my gradients is basically to express this graph, and we'll see how it's useful to us in a second. OK. Camera C. Awesome. So if we want to start our gradient computations, uh, the first thing we, we want to do is to take the derivative with respect to j. So let me write out what my j is going to be. It's going to be half of the Hadamard, uh, sorry, the Frobenius norm of h1 minus h2 squared, f. And we're going to have a regularization term So this is, I'm first writing out uh, what, my, uh, what my cost function is going to be. And I use this graph to kind of inform me about where I'm taking my derivatives and what my error signals are going to be. So the first thing I want to find out, if I want to compute what is the derivative of j with respect to w, this is what I'm interested in. So the first thing we're going to do is flow down this branch. So we're going to compute the partial of j with respect to with respect to the partial of h1. And I'll leave this uh, for you to show in your own time what the derivative over this Frobenius norm is. But it's basically just going to be h1 minus h2. Because the 2 cancels out, and you're left with an h1 minus h2 term. Equivalently, the gradient with respect to h2 is just going to be the negative of that expression. OK? So one thing that I like to do is to also record what the dimensions are of all of my gradients. So over here, since we're dealing with column vectors, this is going to remain an m by 1 vector. And this is going to be an m by 1 vector as well. And the other thing I'm going to do is give a name to these error signals. So this one is going to be delta 1, and this one is delta 2. And what is nice to represent using this graph is what my error signals are flowing down it. So over here, I've defined delta 1 to be the partial of j with respect to partial of h1. And over here, we have delta 2 being the partial of j over the partial of h2. OK? So the next thing we're interested in computing is what is the derivative of j with respect to z1. So we're going to apply our chain rule. We know what the derivative of j with respect to h1 is. So we only, sorry, we want to compute the derivative of j with respect to z1. We know what the derivative of j with respect to h1 is. So we only need to compute the derivative of h1 with respect to z1. So over here, we have a sigmoid activation function. So we just need to compute the gradient over that. So my partial of j over the partial of z1 is going to equal partial of j by partial of h1 times the partial of h1 by the partial of z1. And that is equal to my first error signal with the Hadamard product of, this is getting a bit tight here, um, it's going to equal uh, my error signal, Hadamard product, with um, h1 times 1 minus h1, which, as we know from assignment 1, is the derivative of the sigmoid. I'm running out of space here. Uh, let me move over here. I hope it doesn't get shadowed. Similarly, the partial of, um, of j with respect to z2 is equal to the partial of j by the partial of h2 times the partial of h2 by partial of z2. And that's also going to equal our current error signal flowing down to h2. So it's delta 2 had our product with uh, h2 times 1 minus h2. And we're going to give this a name. This is now going to be delta 4. And this one is going to be delta 3. OK? Uh, so over here, we have delta 3 and here delta 4. OK? So now the last thing we want to do, if we want to compute the gradient of j with respect to w, this is going to equal my error signal up to z1, so partial of j by partial of z1 times the partial of z1 by the partial of w. It's also going to, and we're going to add to that 
what's happening in the error signal at the other branch. So that's partial of j by partial of z2 by the partial of z2 over the partial of w. Plus, we don't want to forget about our regularization term, the partial of lambda over 2 Frobenius norm of w by w. OK? And this is going to now, we need to do some matrix balancing using what we discussed earlier, since we're taking the derivative through over this matrix product over here. So what we need to do is we want to get, we want this final product of each of these things to have the same shape as W. So W is going to be, is an M by N matrix. And this is just given to you in the problem. We know that delta 3 and delta 4 are M by 1. Why? Because because we're simple to compute, um, when we computed what uh, our delta 3 and delta 4 are, we just took uh, the element-wise element product of whatever was up here, so it's still going to remain m times 1. Finally, we know that x1 and x2 are both n by 1, since they're column vectors. So if we want to, we know that we're going to, we know that this is delta 3, and we're going to have to multiply it by the x's in some way. So we see that if we want our final product to be m times n, we're going to have to do this expression times the transpose of this. So this is equal to the delta 3 times w1 transpose plus delta 2, sorry, delta 4 times, sorry, delta 3 times x1 transpose plus delta 4 times x2 transpose. And finally, we want to add this expression. And uh, again, I will leave this for you to show in your own time that the derivative of this Frobenius norm, the two cancels out with this, and you're just left with lambda w. OK? Yes? So the question was, uh, what happens if you run into some sort of ambiguity over here? So the nice thing about when we're, since at least for computing the neural network models that we're looking at for the midterm and, and um, like the only tractable problems that we're going to be computing gradients over are things like linear transformations and activations over those, which are already the key operations that you use in neural networks, apart from things like cross entropies and other, uh, and other losses at the top. So in most of those situations, you won't really run uh, into ambiguities. And when you do, you just go back to deriving things using uh, like traditional uh, matrix calculus. You, you just dig deeper. Like if you dig, uh, dug deeper into how these dimensions work out, it, it should still work out. So you, you just won't, you, you won't find ambiguities in these types of problems. OK. I will quickly run through uh, my second example. Um, OK, so the next example that we're looking at, suppose you wanted to build uh, word vector representations, and you couldn't decide whether you wanted to have a hidden layer that is activated by a sigmoid, or you couldn't decide whether you wanted a hidden layer that is activated by a ReLU. So the only thing better than making a choice is to do both of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a network where at the top we're going to have a cross entropy over some prediction y that takes in some z3. So over here, we're going to have some input, we're going to have some input that flows through both, both of these variables. Uh, so here we have x and w1 plus b. So we're going to apply a linear transformation over our input x 
and then sigmoid activated to produce this hidden layer. Over here, we're going to have a different linear transformation with two other parameters, uh, two other uh, matrix and bias term. But here, we're going to relu activate it. Then we're going to add our h1 and h2. At z3, we're going to get our score matrix, our score of vector, which is z3, and then we apply the cross entropy to that. Okay, that's our model. It's like our, the word vector representation we did in assignment one, except now we have two branches that take the input twice. So what we want to compute at least for this question, is what is the partial of j with respect to x? Okay? So, the nice thing about this problem is that we already know how to compute the derivative of our j with respect to z3, since z3 is the input into our cross entropy. And we did this in our homework. So, the partial of j with respect to z3 is just going to equal to y hat minus y, as we already know. And this is going to be our first error signal. So we already know what the error is from j flowing down to z3, and we're calling that delta 1. OK? The next thing we see is that the partial of z3 with respect to h1 and h2 are actually equivalent. Because if we know what the partial of z3 is with respect to this sum, since the gradient of h1 plus h2 with respect to h1 is just 1, and similarly with h2, we can simply write down that the partial of j with respect to h1 is equal to the partial of j with respect to, sorry, partial of h2. Which is, which is equal to the partial of j up to z3 times the partial of z3 over partial of h1 plus h2. And what we need to do here is, again, some matrix balancing. Since um, we know that h is a 1 by m row vector, and I forgot to specify, but this is actually pretty crucial. I missed the next slide. I con did convert this problem into the exact same model, except using uh, row vectors. Just to show you that the way we do dimension balancing in a row vector uh, versus a column vector situation is basically exactly the same. So we have h being 1 times m, and our w3 is m times k, is m by k. Our delta 1 is also 1 by k. So what we can see is that if we wanted to multiply our error signal from above by what we know is going to be the derivative with respect to h1 plus h2, we're going to need to transpose our w3 and multiply our delta 1 by that transpose. So going up here, I'll just write an equal sign. This is, I'm continuing this line over here. That is just equal to delta 1 by w3 transpose. And I'm going to call this delta 2. And then I'm going to fill in my error gradient flowing down here. OK? Moving over to this side, if we want to move down the branches, we now want to compute the derivative of j with respect to z1 and z2. So the partial of j with respect to z1 is equal to the partial of j up to h1 times the partial of h1 up to z1. And that's just going to equal, since this is an activation, this is a gradient over an activation function, we again use our element-wise multiplication. So that's just equal to delta 2 by, since on the left branch we're doing a sigmoid, we're going to have um, just h1 times 1 minus h1. And on the other side, our partial of j with respect to partial of z2, and I'll just skip writing out, like I'll, I won't write out the chain rule uh, for the sake of time, that's going to equal our delta 2 by the gradient of the ReLU activation function, which is 1 if our z2 is greater than 0, based on the ReLU as we saw it earlier. And we're going to call this delta 3 and this delta 4. So I'm going to fill in the deltas in my graph. OK? Awesome. So the last thing we're going to do, and I'm again running out of space, is to compute the gradients with respect to x, which is what we want to do. So the partial of j with respect to x is going to equal the partial of j up to z1 times the partial of z1 with respect to x 
plus, since we're working with our derivatives, x appears in both branches, it's going to equal the partial of j with respect to z2, partial of z2 with respect to x. Okay? And what we're going to do is matrix balancing one more, since we're once more, since we're taking uh, derivatives over a linear transformation. So we want to make sure our, dim our dimensions balance out. So we know from the problem statement that x is a row vector, so it's 1 times n. Okay? Our w1 and w2 are n by m, and that's just given from the problem formulation. So um, since x is 1 times n, and we're going to need to compute, we're going to need to multiply our error signals by this being transposed, since we want the n to appear on the right-hand side. And although I didn't write it over here, you can see, uh, you can prove to yourself that delta 3 and delta 4 are um, 1 by m. Yeah. So this final expression going down here, since we need to transpose, the, transpose this, it's going to be the error gradient up to this point. So delta 3 times our w1 transpose, since w1 appears on the left side, plus the error signal uh, delta 4 times w2 transpose. OK, I know this was a little bit long-winded, um, but the general approach that we're using is to first of all build the graph of our variables, starting from j. We compute the derivative going down, and at each point we mark what the error signal is up to that point. After that, we apply our chain rule where we compute the derivative of our current variable times our new thing going down, and we multiply that by our error signal coming from above. And we use matrix balancing to make sure our products work out. OK? Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, I would say yes, since it helps you, um, it helps you keep track of um, it helps you keep track of derivatives up to a certain point, uh, and it also helps you. So if you can just take my current error signal, specify what the dimensions of that are, it's very easy to make sure that your dimensions balance out when you compute my current error signal by what follows afterwards. I mean, you don't have to, but it, it certainly is a way of um, keeping like your calculations clean and organized. Okay. For the sake of time, I'm going to move on to the next section, but. Um, but we can take all questions about backprop uh, after the lecture. Uh, so my last slide, and you can look at this up later, your menu for success, but I recommend doing all of them, is to write down your graph, compute the derivatives from the top down, keep track of your error signals, enforce that the dimensions balance out. Um, and yes, that is it. Thank you. Sorry. Cool. Hi, everyone. So our NENs are probably some of the coolest architectures that you've learned in this class, and Juhi and I have the pleasure of unrolling them a little bit further for you. So cool. So let's dive right into it. We'll also show you some midterm questions from past exams. So here, you now have a distributed representation of each patient note. You assume that a patient's past medical history is informative of their current illness. As such, you apply a recurrent neural network to predict the current illness based on the patient's current and previous node vectors. You're asked to explain why a recurrent neural network would be um, better than a feedforward network, in which you input a summation or average of past and current node vectors. So you can talk to your neighbors, just like take a minute to discuss this problem and figure out like why an RNN would actually be better than a feedforward one. Great. And um, are there any suggestions? Are there any suggestions to why RNNs might be better than feed-forward ones? 
Okay, I'll try to repeat what you just said, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So you said that um, the RNNs, um, they can do something specific for a particular patient, and um, while if you sum them up, they wouldn't. Okay, um, thanks. Are there any other suggestions as well? Mm -hmm. And so um, and what you just said, and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that like the more recent information about this patient might be more relevant, and that is something that an RNN could capture, which a feed-forward network might not be able to capture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I just said right now is that um, there is some time dependency in this data since we have a sequence of um, patient notes. And if we were to sum them up together, we lose that temporal information. And so these are all very good answers. And I do want to comment just on the first answer. I think there might have been a slight misunderstanding. So we're not summing up across different patients. We're um, summing um, across the notes for the same patient across time steps. And I think that was probably just like maybe it wasn't phrased super clearly. And um, what um, the other people said was like, and also correct. So one thing is that RNNs can take in like more recent information into account, and in a more general sense, they can take in temporal relationships into account, which we would um, ignore by summing up or averaging over them. Very nice. Cool. So um, in order to also see this more, um, yes, there's a question. The question was, um, what, ad what advantage would an RNN give us over taking a weighted average of the node vectors? Um, well, if you do a weighted average, you actually have to like, come up with the weights for um, the particular nodes, which we actually don't really know beforehand. And the idea of like, training an RNN on here is that like, the RNN might potentially be able to learn to what extent it should take in really um, old nodes into account versus perhaps like, more recent ones. So we don't want to predefine those weights. Does that make sense? Okay, and we can also talk about that after class as well. Um, great, so let's just like, take a really quick um, look at the RNN structure. So this is a very simple vanilla RNN. The key points are that the weights are shared across time steps. We also call them oftentimes tied. And the core of an RNN is the hidden state. And a hidden state depends both on like, the previous hidden state, so it kind of like, captures some of that memory from earlier, as well as the new input. And the backpropagation RNN happens across all time steps. And you should have seen that on the assignment too. And RNNs, because of their architecture, are very suitable for learning representations for sequential data that has some type of temporal um, relationships. And the predictions can be made at every time step. So you can have a Y, as can be seen in this um, figure over here. You can make a prediction every time step, or you can make it at the end of a sequence, depending on whatever your application might be. So in NLP, RNNs um, come to use, especially when we're doing language modeling. So language modeling is the task of computing probability distributions over a sequence of words. So that can be, for example, a sentence or a document. And language modeling is very important when we are doing things like speech recognition, text summarization, and so on. So in an RNN, when we want to use it as a language model, what we pass in every time step, so the inputs xt, are our word embeddings. And, and you could use word embeddings, for example, that you produce with word um, to vec or glove. So you pass them in at every time step. And, and our prediction is just the next word in the sequence. So we can use that um, as a task in order to train this RNN. And the idea is that the hidden representations at the end, so if you take the hidden representation at the last time step on a trained RNN, capture some of the semantic meaning of that sentence or sequence of words. <laughs> 
So that can be, for example, use of translation, which is something you saw, um, on, or like you saw on Tuesday, I think, that Rich, Richard presented. So here, this is actually a, a slightly fancier RNN where you have an encoding part and a decoding part. So for the encoding part, that's like your first RNN. You feed in the word embeddings for like the German words, so like echte Kitze. And, and then you pass in that hidden representation, which captures like the meaning of the sentence into the second RNN. So the weights are shared across the first RNN, and they're shared within the second RNN. And the second RNN is a decoder, which produces the um, English sentence here. So this is like one example of using this type of RNN as a language model for translation. Great. So the problem, though, like with the vanilla RNNs, is um, that we can um, see the problem of vanishing gradients. In backpropagation, when we do backpropagation RNNs, there is a recursive gradient call on the hidden layer. And so that's basically since we define a hidden layer in terms of its previous hidden layer. And the magnitude of the gradients um, of like the typical activation functions that we use, like tan H or sigmoid, are between 0 and 1, which causes, and if you multiply a number that's smaller than 1 multiple times, what happens is that the number will shrink very quickly. And if it shrinks very quickly, essentially what happens is that your final gradient will be close to zero. And if your gradients are close to zero, that essentially means that you're not updating your parameters. And that also just means that your RNNs don't really learn. So in order to uh, address this issue, this is like why people have worked on many different architectures and GRUs, LCMs were some of the more popular ones. Yes, there's a question. Okay, I should also repeat the question. So the question was, um, can, we, um, can we adjust the vanishing gradient problem by using a different activation function, something like a value? Um, yeah, okay, sorry. And your second part was what? Yeah, we can also, we can also discuss this after class too. Yeah. Um, so Good question, though. OK, so GRUs and LCMs to the rescue. So I'll talk briefly about GRUs, gated recurrent units. So the, the addition here is that we are introducing gates. So we have a reset gate and an update gate. And you can intuitively understand these gates as like they're controlling the long-term and short-term dependencies. It's like to what extent do we want to memorize things from the past, and to what extent do we just want to like take something from like the current input. And that might be also something that you might see, or like um, it's related to like what we talked about with patient notes. It's kind of like this network might be able to learn whether I should only look at the last patient note or whether I should take like the entire history into account. So um, this is a more visual representation of um, a GRU. So you can see that the input, XT, um, over here is like fed into both of these gates, which are sigmoid functions. And it's also fed into this other one, which calculates H tilde. So this is like um, kind of like a first initial hidden state. But in order to just um, decide whether we really want, it, uh, want to use it, there is like um, we are using the z factor over here to decide whether we just want to use the previous hidden state or if you want to like update it to the H tilde. And this might also be a picture if you wanted to look at it again. It's like on our um, blog, so you can just try to figure out how, these, um, how this information is flowing in there. Um, but in order to just like, get some more intuitive understanding of how GIU works, um, we are going to do some exercises together. So first, um, try to figure out what the dimensions are of the Ws and the U matrices in here. And um, you can write it in terms of dx, dimension of x and dh, which is the dimension of h. And again, you can just like take a minute and try to figure that out. And you can also discuss again with your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, since we are running a little bit out of time, I'm just gonna go ahead and explain how I would approach this problem. So first, um, you know that HT, so the hidden vector um, H has dimension dH just by definition. So I'll write a little bit bigger. Okay. So this is just by definition, and we um, we also know that um, HT minus one also has dimension dH, which means that one minus ZT, so ZT itself, needs to have dimension dH as well, right? Since we are doing an element-wise operation in the fourth equation over here. So it also shows us that H tilde, so just by looking at the last equation, H tilde needs to have dimension dH as well. And now that we know that um, H tilde has dimension dH, then we can go into the third equation over here. So we know that and the product of W and XC has to give us something with dH. So that tells us that um, the matrix W needs to have dimension dH and dx. Is this clear to everyone? Well, I see a couple knots. Okay, so similarly, if we look at um, the matrix U in there, we know that like the result of U H T minus one needs to be dH, like the shape dH. So first one should be dH, and since we're multiplying it with a hidden vector, the um, second dimension should be dH as well. And you can apply a similar approach to figure out the dimensionality for the other um, matrices as well. Cool, and true false question, if the update gate is close to zero, the net does not update its state significantly. Yeah, this one should be pretty obvious if you look at um, the fourth equation, because in that case, um, you're essentially just setting HT to HT minus one. And this also shows that like, um, if the network learns um, that ZT is like pretty close to zero, that just means that we are um, essentially using our um, input like from the first time and just like, so essentially it just means that like your input from a long time ago still matters a lot in the future. Okay, another related question. If the update gate is close to one and the reset gate is close to zero, the net remembers the past state very well, true or false? Yeah, this is actually very similar to the first question. So again, you can just um, set the um, ZT to one and RT to zero in these equations, and you'll find out that in this case, um, HT would depend very strongly on the input. And since we are essentially saying that this term over here becomes zero, and we're only using the XT part of it. Okay, so Juhi will now um, talk about LCMs. So uh, I'll just run through LSTMs really quickly. Uh, LSTMs are kind of similar to GRUs, except they are a more common model. So uh, instead of just having two gates, now we have multiple gates. Uh, one is the input gate, which decides how much of the how much weight we should give to the current input or the current word that we are looking at. Um, the FT gate or the forget gate uh, will decide how much we want to forget our past um, and just like. Uh, whether we, how much we want to remember the past or just forget it. Um, the new gate OT, which is a little bit different, is how much we want to expose our current cell to future. So combined, the OT from the current, uh, combined with the FT from the future, will decide how much our uh, memory will be used in any other future node. So you can see how adjusting this can decide like whether you just want to remember the t minus three time step, but not t minus two and t minus one, uh, instead of just going linearly backwards and having to remember everything from the past. Um, so all these gates are computed uh, using a sigmoid because that's between zero and one, um, and that makes sure that uh, when you are doing the dot products uh, with all sorry the Hadamard products uh, in the end you have kind of like a probability distribution of um, not just completely forgetting which, which would be zero or completely remembering which would be one, but fuzzy probability of have remembering a little bit or forgetting a little bit. Um, does that make sense? 
Another difference between LSTMs and GRUs uh, is the CT and HD node. So now you don't just have one memory, you have two memories. And uh, these define different things, like your CT would uh, define exactly what your memory is, while your HD defines in your IT, FT, and OT how much uh, or how you want to remember uh, the HD minus one memory, or how much your memory should be remi uh, remembered by the future. So instead of just having one, now we have two. Um, these have a certain number of uh, disadvantages. For example, there are a lot more parameters now, which means you ha need more space, which, need, which means you need more learning, and which also means you need much more training data so that your model doesn't start overfitting. And empirically, GRUs and LSTMs have been uh, very close in terms of results, so in the end, it's a trade-off on how much accuracy you want compared to how much you are uh, willing to use on uh, use your resources on training time and training data. So here's a quick illustration. Um, the lower row corresponds to your HT flow, while the upper row corresponds to your CT flow. Um, and both of them are memories, and uh, they interact with each other, which means they are not completely independent, but they represent different ways in which your future or your um, uh, next words will be using your current word. Yeah, question? So the question was, uh, can you give a little bit of uh, intuition on what is the difference between C and H? And um, so if you see from the, um, the formulae, uh, the H's represent or the H's decide on what your input gates, your FTs and OTs will be. So they decide how much you want to remember or forget or expose yourself. While your CTs are the one that are actually being used in the future, um, so they are the ones that are combining with the gates. And so basically it's like saying uh, your um, HTs will decide uh, the fuzzy probability of how much you want to remember and how you want to remember, and your CT will kind of decide what you want to remember from the previous states. Um, this is just like uh, intuition. It's not exactly like that. You're, like LSTMs might learn something differently uh, depending on your problem statement, but that's like a rough way of how you can think about it. Right, so the question was, will we have the equations? And yes, all the equations for RNNs or LSTMs or GRUs will be included, so that you don't have to remember them. Also, you are allowed a cheat sheet, so to be on the safe side, if you want to remember it, you can just write it on your cheat sheet and you can bring it. Okay, so um, we'll just go through the midterm questions really quickly because we are running out of time. Um, if xt is the zero vector, then ht is equal to ht minus one. Um, it is true that HT will depend primarily on HT minus one, but it won't be exactly equal because of the non-linearities and the multiplication with the parameters. So that's an important difference. Um, the second question is, FT, if FT is very small or zero, then error will not be backpropagated to earlier time steps. Again, intuitively, it feels like because the FT is zero, we are trying to forget, but that is not true because IT and CT still depend on HT minus one, and hence the error will still backpropagate. So uh, one easy way to do it is just look at the math, see what depends on what, and see how the errors are actually backpropagating. The next question is, if uh, are the entries FT, IT, and OT non-negative? And we see that uh, the sigmoid activation is used, which is the range is zero and between zero and one, and so they're always non-negative. Um, and as I said, that just represents the fuzzy probability. Which brings me to the next question, are, can they be views as probability distributions? And the problem with viewing, that, viewing them as probability distributions is that they do not sum to one, like any probability distribution should. So these are applied independently to every element, and thus they'd have no requirement of having to sum to one. So this is just like an intuition of probability, but it's not exactly probability. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Any questions? OK, so very quickly, we'll go through dependency parsing. Um, so we saw two views of uh, linguistic structure. We haven't seen the first one, which was the constituency structure. We'll be seeing it for later. Um, but basically, it uses a kind of CFG model where you decide which phrase is broken down into what words. Um, what we are seeing is dependency structure where we decide what word depends on what other word um, in the sentence and how they depend on each other, so what modifiers are used. 
So just some uh, properties about dependency parsing. Uh, one, uh, it's a binary asymmetric relation with words. So it's binary, which means two words are related to each other, no more and no less. It's asymmetric, which means one word depends on the other, but not the other way around. Um, in this case, the dependent depends on the head, which are the terms that we'll generally be using. And the arrows, when we are drawing the dependency tree, will go from the head to the dependent. Um, they usually form a connected acyclic single head tree. And uh, to make sure that this happens, we also add a fake root node so that the, the one of the words will always have the head as a root node. And this also makes sure that every word has a head and none of the words are just tangling. And in the rare cases where you have an, a disconnected tree, the root node makes sure that all of them are con connected into a single tree. Um, any questions? OK, so we saw two different uh, types of dependency parsing. One was the greedy deterministic transition-based uh, parsing. Uh, we've just seen this in the assignment right now, so I am sure it's all fresh in your memories. Um, you have a stack, a buffer, and a dependency list. Uh, initially, the buffer will be full of the words in your sentences, uh, in your sentence, um, in order. Uh, so that will act like a queue structure. Uh, your stack will act like a stack structure so that uh, you pop from the top of the stack. And whenever you do the shift transition, you take something from the top of the queue and put it onto the stack. The left arc will take the top two elements from the stack and make, a depend, uh, make an arrow from the first element to the second element and just remove the second element. Um, and this can be seen from the example here, which you can just go through the slides and um, go like decide. Now, how do we decide which transition to use? This is generally done by some kind of a classifier, like you could use like multi-class multi as SVMs or any other kind of machine learning classifiers that you know of. Um, the features that any machine learning algorithms need, uh, so here we'll use the features, and you can always add more features, but the typical features that are generally used are is the top of the word on the stack, the, top, uh, the first word in the buffer, and uh, maybe a look ahead on what words are going to come next, and also the dependence of the current word in the stack. And now that we have all the words, we also use the parts of speech of all these words. So generally, we know that adjectives and nouns are very likely to be dependent uh, or connected. So that is something that you would want to use as a feature. Uh, the others are kind of what dependencies that we have already figured out till now. And uh, using all of these, we try to get what kind of uh, transition we want to do next. And the final evaluation metric that we use is either UAS, if we are not typing the dependency from one word to another, or LAS, which is the labeled attachment score, which types the attachment from one word to another. And these are basically kind of like accuracies. Uh, like you can think of them as accuracies. So one thing that we saw was projectivity and uh, how we can handle cases where, where the uh, non-projectivity comes in. And uh, what projectivity means is that there are no arrows that cross each other when you, make, when you put them in a horizontal line. And uh, why this would be a problem is if you go back to this kind of a parsing mechanism. Um, here, the from and who will never be next to each other on a stack, and thus left talk or right talk will never be able to get a dependency between from and who. And so how do we handle something like this? One simple thing would be you just declare defeat. You just say that, OK, these are really, really rare cases. And if you don't care about your accuracy as much, and you don't want to complicate your model a, bit, a lot, then you can just leave them as it is and let them decrease your accuracy a little bit. Um, if you want to handle them, uh, one of them would be to use a post-processor. So you go through the entire parsing mechanism. And in the end, you use some kind of a post-processor to identify which ones have been parsed wrongly and try to, like, try to resolve them. And this can be done using multiple methods like classifiers or um, other things. The last one is you use a completely different uh, parsing mechanism. Um, or you make slight modifications to the ones that already exist. So in the greedy transition-based parsing, you could add a transition, let's say, swap, where you just swap the ele or elements that are already in the stack so that you bring the element that is at the bottom to the top, and then you can um, add a left arc or a right arc to it. Um, there are other more complicated ways of doing it, and those can also be done. Um, finally, we'll have the neural dependency parsing. Um, so one problem with greedy deterministic parsing that we saw was the features were all one-hot vectors, uh, where it was either the word um, or the position, uh, part of speech. 
And we have seen a lot of problems with one-hot vectors before. One is that you don't have the semantic representation of the word. So if two words are actually similar in either uh, grammatical sense or uh, meaning-wise, uh, you don't understand that just because of the one-hot vector notation. And an easy way to do some, uh, to solve something like that is using an embedding matrix. And here we'll not only be using embedding matrix for the words, but also the parts of speech and the dependency labels. And all of these are then added into one uh, feature stack uh, or a feature row. And they are put into a black box, which would be any neural network that you want to use. For example, here you're using a hidden layer and a softmax layer. But that black box could be any neural network. And then finally, you use classification to decide what, tran what transition you want to do. Any questions on dependency parsing? I, I know this was a little quick, but we were running out of time, so. OK, so there are just a couple of acknowledgments. And all the best for your exam.